in just a moment. <laughs> As I looked down at my notes and realized I've got one more thing to say before I get there. Uh, we have this marriage and parenting um, Bible study class get together coming up the first Wednesday of December. It's a 10 week um, class that we're going to be doing. My wife and I have had it on our heart for a couple of years to just be part of the marriage uh, class that takes place here and have an opportunity just to share what what God has done in our lives. So we're gonna we're gonna take five weeks and focus on marriage. We're gonna take five weeks and focus on parenting. And we're going to be looking really using Craig Caster's material from Parenting is a Ministry in San Diego. He is the one that wrote our foundation curriculum that we use in Equip One. And it's just excellent material. And what we're going to do is we're going to be using it and everybody having a handout. And we're going to make it, we're going to make it interactive. We're going to be bringing the truth that we have in there in the Bible scriptures. But then we're going to hopefully just... Uh, be able to have iron sharpen iron and be able to uh, grow from one another's experiences and be able to answer questions and so forth. So it's the kind of a study that is really for, for everybody who is married, not just, oh, my marriage is in real trouble. I better go to the marriage class. No, it's so we can all grow and we can glean off of your experience and your your victories in your marriage, and, and also be able to learn from other people's struggles and, and hopefully be able to point them to the answers that we have, that we really do have in the Word of God. It's funny, we get married, we have kids, and, and we're, there you go, you know, do your best job. And we don't, we're not really given a manual on how do you do this, but within the Word of God, we've got the direction. God has given us the tools that we need to be able to to do that. And so we're really excited about getting together and, and being able to have that. So I encourage you to come out. As Ryan mentioned, we have childcare provided. We've got a really, a really fun time set up for the kids where my kids and Brian Schmoder are going to come together and be able to lead them in a very cool craft oriented curriculum as they learn about the fruit of the spirit from Galatians chapter five. So it's going to be a really fun time but we do need some additional help, and this is the reason I'm making this announcement. We really need somebody that could help us out with the younger kids, meaning the infants or the real young toddlers that are really too young to be able to be part of what's happening with the children's church age kids, which is basically three years old, two years old or so through fifth grade who we're ministering to, but the younger ones under two years old, we could really use somebody that could watch them in the nursery, we're gonna be here in the sanctuary, but in the nursery so that, so that mom and dad can be able to just sit in here and be able to acquire the tools that they need to be able to grow as husband and wife and grow as parents. So if you can help us out, again, it's 10 weeks, starting the first Wednesday in December, six to seven o'clock is all we're looking for. And uh, we'll run into, what will that run into the end of, of January on into February. So if you could help us out, please see me or my wife, Mary, and we'd greatly appreciate it. All right. Now I have a question for you. First of all, please take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 15. But the question is this, what is our foundation? What is our foundation? What do we base what we believe on? What do we base how we should live our lives on? Nobody's saying anything, but if you were to say the Bible, you would say correctly, because the Bible gives us what we need on how to live our lives. And it is God's word that he has left with us. Now, is the Bible God's word, though? I made that statement, but is the Bible God's word? There are some who believe that, yes, the Bible is God's word, and God gave it to us, but he only gave it to us as a start. And then he's also given us religious leaders that he's speaking to and bringing his truth to and his will to. Therefore, when we look to what we believe and how we live our lives, we're looking to the Bible and we're looking to religious leaders who have heard from God who are telling us what God wants to do. Is that our foundation? Some believe that. Or there are people who look at the word of God and they say, well, you know, over the centuries, fallible man has corrupted the word of God. So yes, we have God's word, but there's a lot of corruption in it as well. So we need to decipher and 
pick and choose what's actually inspired by God and what's not, what has been corrupted by men. If we take that approach, and there are people who believe that, if we take that approach, then we're left up to our wisdom. We're left up to, to what we think is truly God's will within his word. Now, having said that, if your foundation is based on either of those two, that's what you're looking to. That's what you're basing your life on. What you feel is inspired of God or not, or what the word of God says and others are adding to it. Or we can look at the Bible and we can go, this is exactly what God wanted to say to us. And this is the foundation for how we should live our lives. The Bible in its entirety. Now, I personally believe there is sufficient evidence to believe that the Bible is in fact God's word and that we can base our entire lives on what we believe and how we live our lives on that. Amen? Amen. That, that's, where, that's where I'm coming from. I know many of us are coming from, but I, I say that so that you can know when you're talking, let's say with one of your friends who believes something differently, you can't always really just go to the Bible and go, well, the Bible says this though, because their foundation might not be the Bible. Their foundation might be parts of the Bible, but other parts have been corrupted, taking away from it. Or their foundation might be the Bible and what my spiritual leader has told me to and adding to it. I believe God has given us exactly what he wanted to give to us, and he doesn't want us to add to it, and he doesn't want us to take away from it. Now, in Jesus' day, the religious leaders had their traditions that had crept in over the centuries. They had the law of God. They had the word of God. But then they had the traditions of the elders who had gone before them, who had added a number of extra laws, extra things to do that went along with God's word. Now, tradition, there's nothing wrong with tradition as long as tradition doesn't go against what the word of God has to say. And as we come to this passage here, we find that The religious leaders are upset because Jesus' disciples don't keep their traditions. Jesus turns it around and points out that at least one of your traditions conflicts, in fact, nullifies the very commandment of God. He's going to talk about an issue that Mark's gospel refers to as Corban. And it's where a person could take their resources and instead of helping out their family, specifically mom and dad, Instead of helping them out, they call it korban, which means it is a gift to God. And so when dad comes up and says, hey, son, can you spare an old man five bucks? He says, hey, listen, I'd love to help you, dad, but everything that I possess, it's korban. It's been dedicated to God. I still get to enjoy it while I'm alive, but it has been dedicated over to God. It's his, so therefore I can't help you. And what Jesus is saying is your tradition is actually nullifying the commandment of God to honor your father and your mother. And so their foundation, not just the law of God, but what they have added to it. Matthew chapter 15, beginning from verse 1. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, this is one of their traditions, that they would wash their hands before they ate. It wasn't the cleanliness type of tradition like we have today where we want our kids to go wash their hands before they eat because we know that those little fingers can go up little noses and we don't want to hold their hands while we're praying before the meal. You know what I'm saying? That's a cleanliness thing. That's a tradition. That's not a bad tradition. But, but their tradition was from more of a ceremonial standpoint. We would look at it as almost like you've got cooties, you've got defilement on you, and if you touch food and you put that food in your mouth, now you have defilement in you, and you have been defiled. And so that that was their tradition. Now, these religious leaders, as we see, the scribes, the experts in the law of God, the lawyers, if you will, of the day, and the Pharisees, the very strict, legalistic, religious leaders of the day, notice that they were from Jerusalem. So they have made the trip. They have made a pretty big effort for that day to come all the way up from Judea up into Galilee to see what Jesus is doing. And in seeing what he and his disciples are doing, they are confronting what they're doing and asking the question and saying, why 
do your disciples not keep the tradition of the elders? How, how much did they honor the tradition of the elders, the Pharisees and scribes I'm referring to? As you read the writings, and, and it's, it's commonplace as you read through commentaries on Matthew chapter 15, that their traditions that they held to were equal, if not held in higher esteem than the very laws of God. Can you believe that? That they look to their traditions as higher than what the word of God actually says. This is from Warren Wiersbe's commentary. And, and it's, not, it's not exclusive to what Warren Wiersbe had to say. I, as I went through commentaries, you could just see people bringing up examples from the old rabbinic writings. But he says, history reveals that the Jewish religious leaders came to honor their traditions far above the word of God. As an example, Rabbi Eliezer said, he who expounds the scriptures in opposition to the tradition has no share in the world to come. So if you're expounding upon the very word of God and it goes against what the traditions have been that came down through the centuries from the rabbis, then you're not gonna go to heaven. That's how strongly they elevated, how much they elevated their traditions. The Mishnah, which is a collection of Jewish traditions in the Talmud records, it is a greater offense to teach anything contrary to the voice of the rabbis than to contradict scripture itself. How about that? And we stand back, we go, wow, can you believe that? So we see what their foundation is. That's what we're trying to see. What is their foundation? This is where they're coming from. So when the disciples are not keeping the tradition of the elders and they're not washing their hands, to them, it's a really big deal. And I think I want, we want that to kind of resonate in our heart again. What is our foundation? What are we basing what we believe on and therefore how we live our lives? What are we basing that on? Is it on the word of God? Or is it on our own wisdom, what we think God's will should be? Or again, what we're hearing from a spiritual leader adding to what we have in the word of God. Again, it's got to be on God's word because God's word has proven itself to be faithful, a credible document. By the way, um, after our marriage and parenting series, 10-week series that we're going to be doing, we're going to go through apologetics for the rest of the season. So we're going to be looking at manuscript evidence, archaeological discoveries, fulfilled prophecy, why we can believe the Bible to be God's word. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? We, we kind of hint around to it a lot, but we're going to dive into that study for the rest of the season. So looking at why we believe what we believe and evidence for the faith for trusting the Bible to be the word of God. And so they have an issue with Jesus's disciples breaking of the traditions for not ceremonially washing their hands. Verse three, he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded saying, honor your father and your mother the fifth commandment. And he who curses father or mother, let him, be, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. So they had their tradition and they used it as a loophole. You know, I'm going to dedicate these things to God. But they would use it as a loophole so that they wouldn't take care of their mom and dad. Now, obviously, obviously, we're talking about an older individual here, aren't we? Somebody who has the resources to help out his father and mother. And it's interesting to see, you know, the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. What does that mean? It's interesting to see how Jesus applies that here. Because when we think about honoring our father and mother, I think, and rightly so, we feel we should respect our mom and dad. And when we're living at home, we should obey our mom and dad. You know, it's their house, it's their rules. But then when we get out of the house, I think we all believe that we should continue to respect our mom and dad. I mean, we're living our own lives now, but, but we should continue to respect our parents because they're our parents, honor your father and mother. But it's neat to see how Jesus applies this and you see that the father and mother, it's implied that they're in need and the child is not willing to help out his mom or dad. And I think that what that communicates to us, that honoring our father and mother is more than just obeying them when we're young or um, respecting them when we get older, but it's taking care of them, isn't it? It's taking care of them when they get older. In other words, they took care of us when we couldn't take care of ourselves. And when they get to that point 
where they can't take care of themselves, the responsibility really is ours, isn't it? To take care of them. What Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, he said, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The expectation is that we take care of our families, and obviously that's our, our spouses and our children, but I, I think especially how Jesus is using this, it's speaking about taking care of our mom and dad as they get older. And it is interesting to see, isn't it? You have kids, the kids can't take care of themselves, they're totally dependent upon you, and you train them, you raise them up, and then they're, they're out and they're able to live in the world, but then you grow older to a point where you can't take care of yourself anymore. Who's gonna take care of you? What does the Bible say about it? The kids. The kids are the one that really have that obligation, that responsibility, that privilege to be able to take care of mom and dad. It's a neat picture. It's neat how God has, has designed it. But here with their tradition, they've nullified the commandment of God to honor your father and mother for they had their tradition where they could go, well, you know, everything that I have is, is as it says here in verse five, a gift to God. That is the word korban. It's taken from the Hebrew. And in Mark's gospel, it just uses the word korban. In other words, everything I've got, I've dedicated to God. So I'd love to help you, but I can't. I'm going to live with everything and enjoy it until I'm gone, but you can't have any of it. And so um, their tradition, again, traditions, good, bad, well, only if they're conflicting with what the word of God has to say. What does Jesus call them? Verse 7, hypocrites. What's a hypocrite? Have you ever heard that word before, hypocrite? If you're a Christian, you've probably heard that word before, haven't you? I would go to church if it wasn't for all the hypocrites that are at the church. And you know, there is an element of truth in that. There is an element. What is a hypocrite? Well, defined from Strong's Concordance, looking at the, the biblical word, the word hypocrite is defined as an actor or a pretender. From Lou Nida's Greek lexicon, a hypocrite is one who pretends to be other than he really is. A pretender. I go to church on Sunday. I look really religious. But when I go out in my workaday week, I'm a completely different person. On Sunday, I'm just pretending. I'm an actor. That's what a hypocrite is. Pretending to be someone that you're not. And that's what he's calling the religious leaders of his day. The religious leaders of his day are the ones that were supposed to be the example to the rest of the people. They were the ones that were to communicate the law of God, the will of God to the rest of the people. They are the ones that we're supposed to be showing this is what God's like. And you know, you guys, if we bear the name Christian, a follower of Christ, isn't the same thing pretty much true with us? We're the ones that are supposed to be showing what the love of God is like. And so we don't want to pretend and be really a different person in heart. We want to be the real deal. Amen? We don't want to be a hypocrite. And so... He quotes from Isaiah the prophet. He goes back 700 years and draws from Isaiah's words to apply it to what the religious leaders were doing at that time. Verse 7, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, quote, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men as doctrines. These are our foundational teachings, but it's merely the traditions of men. That's how he's applying Isaiah. But what arrests my attention is verse 8. They draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It's not the things that we say. In reality, it's not even really the things that we do, but it's our inner selves that's important. Where is our heart? The real me. Where, is, where am I with that? God's interested in our heart. Not so much interested in the words that come out of our mouth or even the things that we do, but more importantly, where our heart's at. Because it's kind of like we say earlier, from the inside out, if the inside is right, then it's going to naturally come out, the goodness. So if our heart's in the right spot, when Jesus was asked, what is the number one, what is the great, what is the chief, what is the first commandment? 
in the law. In other words, if we go back in these 39 books of the Old Testament, if you could give us the number one thing that God is interested in, what's the number one commandment? What would it be? Well, keep the Sabbath day. Well, make sure you tithe and make sure you offer the animal sacrifices. What's, what's the number one thing Jesus responded to them? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. <laughs> what is the number one thing God wants? Isn't that neat to see that? You know, when we think about God, what does he want? He wants our love. And he wants the entirety of our being to love him. Notice that. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And in five times in the book of Deuteronomy, God says that. To love him with all of your heart or to serve him with all of your heart. And of course, love is seen from the inside out in actions of obeying God, isn't it? So when you look, and this is a neat thing, isn't it? When we're looking at the Old Testament. Deuteronomy is the law, the, first, the fifth book of the Bible. Okay, it's the law of God. We think of the Old Testament and we think, we think oh, that's you know, God and judgment. And, and, and Well, wait a minute. As we read through the Bible, we find that God is the same. He doesn't change. And when we look in the Old Testament, we see throughout the Old Testament the heart of God. What does he want from you? He wants your heart. He wants you to love him. He wants to be, doesn't it speak of relationship? You know, when you think about it, for you to love him, he obviously loves you. We not only read about God's love, but we see it demonstrated in Jesus going to the cross and laying his life down for the sins of the world. This is what God sees. This is what God cares about. He cares about our heart. Otherwise, when you think about it, we're playing the hypocrite. We're a pretender or an actor if we're just going through the motions and our heart is not right on with God. Verse 10, when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. It's not forgetting to wash your hands and, and touching something and now you've defiled yourself. No, it's, it's not what goes in, but it's what comes out. And he's going to expound on that in a couple of verses. For what comes out of our mouth are the words that we speak. And the words that we speak oftentimes are a reflection of where our heart is. Where our heart is. And that's what he's focused on. Verse 12, then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended? When they heard this saying, remember, Jesus just called them hypocrites. And so they did, hey, Jesus, do you know that they were offended when you said this? But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Doesn't that remind you of the parable of the wheat and the tares where the, the, the guy planted the, the good seed and then an enemy came and planted bad seed and you have the wheat and the weeds growing up together but at the end of the age there's going to be a separation, a day of reckoning. And so every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Verse 14, let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. Jesus had some very direct words. I was going to say harsh words, but some very true, I think, direct words for them, calling them hypocrites, blind leaders of the blind. You might say not very religiously tolerant if you weigh it by our modern day standards, not very politically correct to call somebody who's believing something different than you a hypocrite, <laughs> a pretender, calling them out on the carpet. We were going through Second John on Wednesday night. And John, as he's writing, he makes a real point. If a false teacher, somebody that's coming with any other doctrine, if a false teacher comes, don't welcome them in your house. Don't even greet them. It's like this total shunning of this person who's bringing heresy. And I read this quote out of the Bible Knowledge Commentary that I wanted to read for us today because we live in, in, a, in a day where being religiously tolerant of other people and what they believe is the standard. And for us to say, oh no, no, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is heresy, or what you're believing is heresy. It's just not tolerated today. But listen to what the Bible Knowledge Commentary had to say concerning a comment on 2 John, where John is saying, if you've got a false teacher coming, don't welcome them in your house. Don't even greet them. They say, to some modern minds, 
These instructions seem unduly rigid and harsh. A great part of the problem, however, lies in the modern inclination to be highly tolerant of religious differences. One must frankly face the fact that the New Testament writers did not share the spirit of toleration. And when you look at it, it's true. You don't see that in the New Testament writers. You see them standing up for the truth, like Jude said, to be ready to defend the faith. Their commitment to the truth and their consciousness of the dangers of religious error called forth many stern denunciations of false teachers. Not surprisingly, this modern age, having a diminishing sense of the dangers of heresy, has lost its convictions about the truth. Kind of come back to what is our foundation? Is it God's word? If it's God's word, then we look at the writers of God's word and we see how they stood strong. For the truth. And if there was error, they pointed it out. I think that's good for us to see. For the religious leaders of Jesus' day, he referred to them as blind guides. What is that saying? They don't know where they're going. You know, they obviously don't have a heart for God. So how can they lead anybody else in the ways of God? Verse 15, then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. It's really pretty clear, isn't it? Whatever you eat, it's just going to pass on through. But whatever comes from within, and that's seen in the words and in the actions, that's what can defile you. The evil thoughts, being a liar, being bitter, being critical, adultery, all of the things that he's saying here, it comes from within. You know, when you look at the inside of a person, Apart from God, we are corrupt. We have a sin nature. And that's just a result of being a descendant of Adam. When Adam failed in the garden, when he fell, he passed on to us what he did not himself possess, and that was a relationship with God. And so we are a fallen race. And of ourselves, there's really nothing good in there. In fact, it tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Now, that's a picture of us without God. But with God, you see, this is where things change. Because when you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and he washes you and he regenerates you and he makes you a new creation in Christ, amen? And so you have the Holy Spirit residing within now And so he's giving the desire to live for God. And he's giving the ability to be able to see that through as well. In Ezekiel chapter 36, as as God is speaking to his people, what he has in store for them, we get a picture of this new covenant. Ezekiel 36 verse 26 from the New Living Translation. God said, and I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I personally think he's talking about the Holy Spirit that's going to come and make, under the new covenant, make his people a brand new creation in Christ. So that, you know, am I the corrupt, deceptive person anymore? No, the Holy Spirit resides within and he's made me a new creation. And I know the thoughts going through your mind. Well, then how come I still struggle with all of these things then if I'm a new creation? The reality is, is because the sin nature is still present with us. We're still in these mortal bodies that are affected by sin. That's why we're growing older and eventually will die if the Lord does not come first. We live in corrupt bodies that still have the sin nature present with us no longer has to have the power over us, but still present with us. Galatians chapter 5, Paul talks about walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does he mean by that? He means to, to yield our lives. The Holy Spirit has come inside 
and he's given you new life, to yield your life to what he wants to do, and you won't fulfill the lust or the desires of the flesh or the sinful nature that is still present with us. This is how it reads in the New Living Translation, Galatians 5.16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. He talks about a war that's going on inside. I'm not talking about schizophrenia or anything, but there's a battle going on inside. A battle to do the right thing or to do the wrong thing. And this is what we teach our kids. This is what we remind ourselves of, is that it's a matter of calling out to God for help. You know, when you start going through the things where you're being tempted into the flesh, it's like, God, I need your help. And he will. He's there to come and help. It's really, in a sense, that simple to call out and say, God, I cannot do it on my own because I see myself failing if I continue to go this direction. I need your help. Please help me. That's the thing he wants to do. And then he begins to strengthen. He's put the desire in our heart and he begins to strengthen and give us the ability to be able to make those choices and to be able to live for him. And the more that we do that, and this again is what we teach our kids and what we remind ourselves of, the more we do that, it becomes a habit. It it becomes habitual where we're looking to God. Again, our desire is to let the Holy Spirit guide our lives. And so when that choice comes up, I want to make that decision. I want to make the decision to do the wrong thing. I'm welling up inside. Lord, please help me. And I want to make that decision. And it becomes a lifestyle. That's the idea of walking in the Spirit. You're living your life according to the leading of the Spirit. So it's the choice. It's the choice that we're left up to. And, And getting back to what it's talking about here, What's going on inside is what's going to be seen on the outside, okay? So even in a Christian, that's the idea. Where is my heart at? Well, my desire is to live for the Lord. I'm calling out to him. It's going to be seen in the things that we say and the actions that we commit. But if we're like, I just live according to the flesh, you know, I struggle, but I always give in, you're going to see that, the fruit of that coming out as well. In Galatians 5.25, He said, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives, just giving ourselves over to him. Amen? So this first part, this is like the bulk of the message. We're going to do the whole chapter, but this is is the bulk of it right here. What is our foundation, and how do we live our lives? And the answer to that, the Bible, and we live our lives desiring to be the people God wants us to be. What is that? To love him with all of our heart. Let's go ahead and look at the next couple of stories that we have here. In verse 21, um, Jesus is actually leaving. He's in the area of Gennesaret, which is on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he's going up to the area of Tyre and Sidon. This is present-day Lebanon, and he's going to encounter a Gentile woman that's in need up there. In verse 21, then Jesus went out from there, And departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now he's coming to Gentile territory. There's a woman with a severely demon-possessed daughter who seeks deliverance. And Jesus, as we've been reading, he is healing the multitude. So he is able, but he doesn't say anything to this woman. And the disciples, I think getting a little on the irritated side, they just send her away. And then he makes this statement, I was not sent except to Israel. And we see that theme. We see that theme in the New Testament. When he sent out the 12 in Matthew chapter 10, he commanded them and said, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is your mission. Go to the Jewish people. In John chapter 4, when Jesus is at Jacob's well, there's the Samaritan woman there. And he says to her, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Well, let's think about that for a moment. Because it's true. God chose 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Jacob, or the 12 tribes of Israel, and he made many promises to them. He revealed himself to them through his word, through his law that we have in his word. And he promised time and again that he was going to send to them a deliverer, one that could rescue them. And that one came. And that one who came was born of a Jewish woman. And according to his humanity, he was Jewish. He was coming to his own people, wasn't he? In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Has that ever grabbed your attention? Well, what does that mean? Think about the Apostle Paul. When he was on his missionary journeys, he went into a new town. Where did he go first? He went to the synagogue. He went to the place where the Jews worshipped. He went to the synagogue first, and after that, he would go to the marketplace. What's taking place here? I think, simply put, God is fulfilling his promises to his people. He said he's going to bring a new covenant. He said he's going to bring the Messiah. All of the scriptures, all of the prophecies we have about the coming of Jesus, these are God's promises to his people. I'm going to send you a deliverer exclusively, no, but initially, yes. And it's a great picture of God fulfilling what he said he was going to do. So Jesus comes to his own, but what happened? His own received him not. But God was still faithful, wasn't he? God was faithful, and so we see, I believe that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the mission of Jesus, and through the disciples, and, and then through the apostles, as they initially, not exclusively, but initially, take the gospel to God's chosen people because God had promised them. And God is a fulfiller of his promises. But then it will go. And as we see here, with this, think about this, this Canaanite woman. It's a Gentile woman, but the Canaanites, those are the people that got driven out of the land when Israel came in and possessed it. And we see not just the faithfulness of God in coming to his people, we also see the graciousness of God and his mercy as he touches this woman's daughter. Verse 25, then she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now, he's not calling her names like you're just a dog, but he's, he's giving a principle there. It, it wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to reach over and take my son's hamburger and throw it across the room to the dog. And yes, sorry, Mikey, you know, the dog's going to eat your food. No, it was for you. But as, as she says here in verse 27, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Now, isn't that true in our house? <laughs> as soon as we're done eating, we get up, dog knows she can come right in and just be the vacuum and take care of it all. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. She's like, all I want is a little crumb. I recognize who you are and who you have come to fulfill your promises to, but all I have is a little girl who needs your touch. And Jesus heals her, heals her and touches her life. It's an amazing, awesome thing because we see God's love and his graciousness and what ultimately is going to happen as the gospel continues to spread. Now, um, we see him leaving from there. And I, I actually did have one other scripture that really identifies this really well. Romans 15, 8, check this out in the New Living Translation, where Paul says, remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. Isn't that neat? He came to show that God is a fulfiller of his promises that he made to the ancestors. Well, now Jesus leaves the area of Tyre and Sidon and comes to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Mark's gospel tells us that this is the area of the Decapolis, which means the ten cities. Verse 29, Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others, and they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maim made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. 
Can you, I mean, just I put myself in, in that mindset and I just think about all of these people who have been struggling for years, maybe their whole life, and they come to Jesus and now they're perfectly healed and the people are just amazed and they, they glorify God. They glorify the God of Israel. And again, this is what God said he was going to do. He said he was going to come as their healer, that he would come and he would bring the deliverer. Isaiah 35 really speaks right to this. Isaiah 35 verses 3 through 6, it says, strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees, say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then, The eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Neat thing about it, I mean, we see Jesus doing these miracles, don't we? Neat thing about it, Isaiah 35, it's really a prophecy of the millennium, of the kingdom age, when Jesus will come at his second coming and rescue his people and bring judgment upon his enemies, and he will set up his kingdom. And that's what life is going to be like during the kingdom age. And we get a little picture of it as we follow Jesus through the gospels, as the multitudes come bringing their sick, and he makes them all better again. So in the kingdom age, it's going to be a lot like paradise conditions, where Satan will be bound, and you won't have the demonic activity, which is a world that is real, that is parallel to ours that we don't see, but it is just as real. We won't have that. We won't have the sickness. We won't have the disease. You'll have the longevity of life as he reigns upon this earth. And so that is actually a prophecy of that that we see fulfilled in in part during Jesus' ministry on the earth. Verse 32, now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? It was last week when he fed the 5,000, not counting women and children. You know, maybe short-term memory issues going on here. I don't know. But it gives us a picture, too, of what's going on. Three days. We just read, and he healed all of these people. Three days this has been going on as the multitudes are bringing the people to him. And so Jesus said to them, verse 34, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them and gave them to his disciples and the disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled and they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. So it's not the exact same story, is it? But it's very, very similar. In the other story, he's fed 5,000 men besides women and children. Here it's 4,000. In the other one, they had five loaves and two fish. Here they have seven loaves and a few fish. In the other ones, they picked up 12 baskets full. In this one, they pick up seven large baskets full, different Greek word. And it made me think that, you know, maybe this happened a lot. When we read the Gospels, we've got a tiny little picture of what life was like for that three and a half year window that Jesus ministered. At the end of John's Gospel, it tells us that Jesus did a lot of things, but these were written down so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ and that in believing in him, you would have life in his name. So he wrote down what he did so that you could become a believer in Jesus. But he said, I suppose if you took everything that he did that you could not fit, the books would not fit in the entire world. That's how much happened. So I think about this, the feeding of the multitudes, and I thought maybe it was a, you know, an ongoing thing that he did. The key thing that commentators bring out about this passage, again, remember where they are. They're on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Mark's gospel tells us it's the Decapolis, and that just literally means the 10 cities. But these cities were Greek cities in that area. So what commentators bring out is that this crowd is most likely largely a Gentile crowd, where the feeding of the 5,000 was largely a Jewish crowd, which begins to give us that picture of the gospel, or the effects of the gospel going from the Jewish people to the Greek people. Interesting thing to think of, huh? The very last verse, and he sent away the multitude, got into the boat, 
and came to the region of Magdala. So we've pretty much gone full circle. We've gone from the Sea of Galilee to Tyre to the Decapolis, and now we're back to the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. What do we want to walk away with today? What is our foundation? What is our foundation? Answer the Bible. It tells us how to live our lives, the truth that we can believe in. And then the question comes, comes up again, though. How do we live our lives? Are we pretenders? Or are we men and women that desire to love God with all of our heart, with the entirety of our being? Now, you might be thinking, well, how do you do that? How can I just love God with all my heart? And the answer to that kind of takes me back to the marriage and parenting class. I've known couples that say, I love my spouse more now than I loved him the day I got married. And, and how could that be? It's because you get to know them more and, and you see who they are. And I understand, not every relationship is like that. I understand that. But it's by getting to know the person more. And that's the answer with God. It's by getting to know him more. As we read his word again, back in Deuteronomy, five times, love God with all of your heart, serve him with all of your heart. You see the heart of God there. You see God's love demonstrated in sending his son Jesus. And as we read, and that's the thing, as we meditate upon the word of God, we just see how much he loves us. And it's true. It's not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he gave his son to be the sacrifice for our sins. It's demonstrated. As we see that, what does it do? It creates within our heart a love for him so we can love him with all of our heart. See how it works? It's a relationship. So draw near, draw near to God. If you want to know more about Jesus, if you've come out today and you're like, boy, I want to be in that relationship with God, then please come forward. We'd love to pray with you. Jesus came to die for the sin of the world. So he came for you. It's a matter of coming to him, acknowledging that you're a sinner and asking him to be the Lord and Savior of your, of your life. And then begin following him, learning more about him. Amen. So you have the opportunity to come forward at the close of this song that we have. Why don't we go ahead and stand for a closing word of prayer? Father, you are so good, and we thank you so much for your love that we see explained in the scriptures. And I do pray that you will help us all. And I know we're all in so many different spots of our walk with you, but that you would help us all simply draw closer to you. And I pray that you would be revealing and that you have been revealing to our hearts things that we need to do to be able to set our priorities in the right order so that our lives will be the lives you want them to be. Thank you for loving us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.